Give me, give me a second. Sorry, guys. The, my wife just put the kettle on and it's screaming, and nobody is going <laughs> hey. over there to turn it off, and it's still shrieking and going and go. Okay, there we go. Woo! All right, I'm good. Ow! Oh, from New York, New York, you are listening to Extra Time, driven by Continental from my bedroom in Brooklyn. I'm Andrew Weavy with my partners in soccer, Matt Doyle, Charlie Davies, David Goss. What's up? Another day, another podcast, boys. Everybody healthy? That's good. Hope everybody out there listening is healthy and somewhat sane. Hold strong, everybody. Do what you got to do. How you boys feeling? Everything good? Charlie, don't drink too much, man. We don't want to have to, you know, <laughs> pause this and yeah. if you have to go somewhere, a name that could be sketchy. I should be good. I should be good. Okay. Okay. This is my, like, I think fourth a uh, cup of co- uh, tea in the past three hours. So, so we'll how see. do you feel? You're not going to be good then. Yeah. You're, you're gonna you're <laughs> no, gonna leave. It. I mean, Doyle. I rumor just, is I because, just went to the restroom. I should be good because we're recording from home. I've heard that Charlie just goes straight catheter for the show. Yeah, that's so, uh, that's we got that camera down. I've been, we there, can... been there, been there, done that. Like that that's astronaut that who had true. to wear the diapers because she was driving across country. Remember that story from a few years ago? Oh back? my god! So we've Remember hit when catheters stories like that would be weird. <laughs> now it's diapers, like, oh. and that's my cue to jump in here. Uh, we're gonna have Stephen Betisher joining us in just a second to talk about the first ever El Trafico, what he's up to these days, Iran, all number of things. Of course, on Monday night on FS1, you can watch the first ever El Trafico, a.k.a. the Zlatan game. It's in its entirety. And then on Tuesday at 4 p.m. on MLS channels, uh, let's see, Benny Failhaber, Chris Pontius, Kalen Carr, our own David Goss will take you through that as well and provide running commentary. So check MLSsoccer.com for all those listings. We'll talk to Stephen in a second, but bigger than that, more important than that today is National Doctors' Day in the U.S. Our thoughts go out to every single doctor, medical worker, uh, person laundering uniforms, making masks, doing whatever it is that everyone is doing to help people stay safe, to stay healthy, to help them recover. Uh, All your efforts are greatly appreciated here at Extra Time, from me in particular. Uh, And we're going to talk to Robbie Russell here in just a second, who's a former MLS player who is now an emergency room intern in Virginia. He's going to kind of take us through what's happening in his life, how he's dealing with this, whatever advice he might have for you. But before we get there, I just want to throw it out to the group here. Anything that you want to say, feel you need to say, as MLS kind of unites right now and, and gets behind the people who are really helping us get through this pandemic and this crisis? For me, it's just do your part. Stay home. Stay home. That's all you can do. And it's it's really simple. Distance yourself by staying home. If you stay home, nothing can happen. Nothing will spread. And we're doing everyone else right. Because this isn't about yourself. This is about everyone else. You're being a, a, a good human being. That's that's what it is, is you're helping others. And and I just can't stress that enough is just be home, stay at home, and and do your part. And look to Seattle. Like Seattle, the, the transmission rate for this disease was somewhere around, uh, I think, an R3 um, a couple of weeks ago, and they have it down to 1.4. So they've cut it in half just by being responsible. Charlie's absolutely right. Stay home, and if you do have to go out, um, you know, stay far apart, uh, you know, wash your hands, sneeze into your elbow. Um, you're doing it for yourself, but you're doing it for other people too. The thing that, that hit me hardest uh, of all of this was the, the other day I, I, I read a, a, an article, I think it was 52, 51 or 52 Italian doctors have died. Because they are out there um, treating the sickest of the sick, putting themselves at risk to to save people, um, and and it just broke my heart because uh, they're all heroes, every single one of them. And um, the last thing I want to do, and I think the last thing any of you should want to do, is put someone else at risk, especially the people who are out there on the front lines uh, fighting to to keep civilization together at this point. Yeah, my 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 cousin is an attending at uh, New York Presbyterian, so uh, he's 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 an attending for you know infectious diseases. So he's he's well aware of what we need to do to combat this this serious virus, and it literally is stay at home and wash your hands. Do what you got to do. Fortunately, on our end, we feel like we're coming out of it. My wife's feeling much better. Uh, I've been good, but we've been uh, inside for a long time. It's boring. It can be tough. 
but it is what you got to do to save those around you from having an emergency that they don't want to deal with. Let's talk now to Robbie Russell. He's an emergency medicine intern at the Virginia Health System. You also know him from uh, a number of years in Major League Soccer with RSL in D.C. He won a championship, had a big PK there, played in Scandinavia for a long time, and then shifted his career path. It's an AT&T call to the field. Robbie, welcome to Extra Time. Thanks for having me, guys. Yeah, so just catch people up if they didn't know, if they're not paying close attention to uh, your your education after your career and where you're where you're going and what you're doing now. Uh, what what's up in the life of Robbie Russell? Uh, well, I uh, made a, a very large change in terms of my career goals. Um, I had uh, after I was done playing, I decided to go back to medical school, um, graduate from medical school, and now I'm a, an acting physician here in uh, Charlottesville, which is has been quite the uh, transition. Um, and you know, I, I, I picked emergency medicine as my field. Um, so that's been kind of exciting. It's been a, this is my first year and it's like a, you start off as like an MD that's in training, um, so to speak, which is what an intern is. Um, and you know, it's, it's been a, a very interesting wild ride, um, for this first year. I can only imagine national doctors day today. We've already done our, our spiel here, but I just want to say it again, Robbie, to you. Thank you so much for everything that you're doing. Thank you to everyone around and with you whether it be doctors nurses you know the people janitors whatever it is anybody that's in that hospital helping people uh we just want to say from us and from our listeners thank you so much tell us about what you're doing tell us about what it's like right now and and how you're experiencing this uh covid19 pandemic well i mean for us as um residents um we kind of come in and we're training under our attendings who are like the, the big docs um and it's it's that's it's definitely going to be a part of our experience in terms of our first year as physicians um we will be the physician generation that kind of experienced covid and and that sort of thing um and so for it it kind of affects our training in ways where you know things wouldn't necessarily everyone's adjusting you know and it's just a constant adjustment um but it it helps coming from my background as a you know an athlete um you know you're used to kind of adjusting to things um and you don't know what any days gonna bring and and so it, uh, it, it helped having those kind of strengths and having those kind of resources in your back pocket because it um, keeps you on your toes. Um, but, you know, I'm, I'm here training now and trying to get as much experience, trying to learn as much as I can and, you know, just trying to help people. Um, and and that's, that's, that's why I came into medicine um, after playing and, you know, I'm getting to do that. And so that's what's most important. We've talked a lot about what's going on, of course, and it's at the front of everyone's mind. It's affecting everyone's life can you talk a little maybe for people about you know some advice or things that people should focus on and we've talked about washing your hands simply but maybe from someone who actually knows what they're talking about Uh, i mean i I think the biggest thing is that you know of course i'm not going to give any kind of advice medical advice you know but um i think paying attention to you know the the report out of the cdc and paying attention to our you know established evidence-based kind of recommendations um you know, that's, that's the biggest thing. And, and they may change pretty consistently. So you have to kind of stay on top of things. Um, the CDC website's a great resource. Um, but of course, um, you know, it's, it's one of those things where it's very regional based. Um, and so you have to kind of do a little bit of research and figure out what your region um, is recommending and, and doing your best to kind of follow through with those. We know what's happening here in our own region in in New York City, and um, there are some scary times here, some real anxious times. In Charlottesville, in Virginia, how are you experiencing it? What are you doing in the emergency room? What are the duties that you have right now? I mean, personally right now, um, you know, the way your intern year works is that you spend a lot of time kind of rotating through other services. Um, and so, you know, right now I'm, I'm rotating through a different service than the ED, but, you know, of course there's always backup calls. Um, and, and for me personally, um, you know, I'm, I'm quarantined, not, I guess not quarantine is the right word, but I'm staying away from my family. Um, they live out in Northern Virginia. And so I haven't seen them in like a month and a half, um, just because I'm trying to kind of do my part to make sure I'm not, you know, a, a source of spreading the infection. And so, um, there's, it's difficult, you know, it's part of the experience we, we're going to have as like interns and as residents. Um, but you know, you, you have to do what you have to do. As someone who's in the medical professional field, all of us feel helpless and we want to say thank you and we want to help any way we can. Is there any advice you'd have for people of messages to send or things that they can do to try and ease the burden a little bit on people who are, you know, fighting this on the front line? I mean, I think the biggest thing is kind of reaching out to, 
um, different, you know, um, charities and different, you know, um, activities that are doing things to, you know, provide resources to our medical health care system. Um, and every, like I said, everything is regional and it's kind of in, in your area, it might be different than someone else's area, but um, kind of staying involved, doing what you can to kind of follow the guidelines. Um, and then, you know, if there's any kind of like ways you can volunteer or help, um, you know, trying to figure that out. Um, but that's going to be entirely like personal and, and individual based um, and, and doing your best to kind of, um, you know, get through this very strange time we live in now. This is a personal question, Robbie, and feel free to sort of brush me off if you feel you need to. But you mentioned being away from your family in this uncertain situation where you're going to work every day. And uh, we know what the situations in many hospitals are. Is there any what are the emotions that you're feeling? Is there any fear? Is there apprehension? How are you dealing with this personally? I mean, personally, it's there's a lot of unknowns. You know, you don't you don't know what it's going to look like in a month, what it's going to look like in two months, what it's going to look like in three months. How long is this going to last? And I mean that you're, everyone is kind of dealing with that. Everyone's struggling with that. Um, and you know, for me personally, just because I'm in healthcare, it doesn't mean I I necessarily have a crystal ball to be able to predict things, that sort of thing. And so um, you just kind of rely on um, you know the information that you have, and you, you you like to kind of use things that are evidence based, and you know the scientific method is there for a reason, you know, and so. Um, following it along, like, you know, it gives us as much information as it can, but it's a slow process. And so um, I think so much of that anxiety comes from that unknown and not knowing how long this will last, how long. But um, I think the biggest thing I've done is just trying to take it one day at a time, you know, and you show up and, and do it. You're supposed to do that day. And then, like, if it changes, you adjust. And if it continues to go on, then you do your best to kind of roll with it. Um, it doesn't always feel great. Um, you know, I miss my kids, I miss my wife, but, um, you know, I, I, I would always hate to kind of put them at risk just because, you know, the short term, you know, in the end, I'm, I'm thinking this is going to be a blip, you know, like six months, a year from now, I'm just being like, listen, we, we got through this. Um, but I wouldn't want to like have it where something I did kind of made it, um, a much bigger thing for us, you know, um, that's all, that's all I can do personally, you know? So I just want to say before we let you go and get back to work again, thank you, Robbie, for everything that you're doing. We remember all the moments on the field. I'm like replaying the 2009 penalty shootout right out right now. Yeah, you know, Javi Mo and and Kyle and all that. It's, it's amazing stuff. More pressure stepping up in front of that PK or doing what you do now. Uh, <laughs> um, I'm gonna say doing what I do now, um, but um, that was a good day too. <laughs> but he has All to worry right. about Kyle Beckerman getting mad at on the other one, so it's probably <laughs> close. Sounds <laughs> out. Sounds yeah. out. <laughs> uh, Robbie Russell, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for what you're doing and everybody around you. Please pass our uh, well wishes onto them as well. An emergency medicine intern at the University of Virginia Health System. Best of luck to you, Robbie. As I said, everybody around you, your family, uh, the MLS community is thinking about you, man. Thank you. I appreciate it, guys. Big thanks to Robbie Russell for joining us here and doing what he's doing every day. It's heartbreaking, as Doyle said, to hear what's happening to medical professionals, and Robbie's having to separate himself from his family right now as he does the work that must be done. Uh, anything you want to say to doctors, do it. If it's in your personal life, if it's just a social media post, feel free to use the hashtag MLSUnite. Uh, we're all behind them. We're all hoping for the best, and we're all doing what we got to do in these strange times. Let's jump ahead and talk soccer here. Jameson Menzel via email said he's a relative newcomer to soccer and MLS, but the game that sold me on the league was the first <laughs> El Trafico in 2018. Though I was rooting for LAFC, I was so intrigued by Zlatan's cocky persona, understatement there, and how he became a villain of sorts in my mind, which kept me watching the league. Do you think that having a villain is important in being a soccer fan? I'll go ahead and answer that one, Jameson. Yeah, it's real important to have those sort of characters. Even Josie Altador was saying last year, we need more of them. And if so, is there a specific player any of you love to hate? We'll get to that in the all load the 11 in the mailbag. Um, but I just want to kind of jump this off before we talk to Stephen Betisher about that El Trafico, about LAFC, about Zlatan, and just kind of open the floor and ask you guys how you experienced that game. Because we have some streams coming up on Monday night, FS1, 8 p.m. Eastern, I believe, and then 4 p.m. Eastern on Tuesday on YouTube, Facebook, uh, and MLS channels. David Goss, Kalen Carr, Chris Pontius, Benny Failhaber, as I said, commentating throughout that match. So, Charlie, I'll start with you, man. Where were you? How did you experience this? I can remember exactly where I was and everything that I did. Same. 
I was in New York City with you guys. Oh, I forgot <laughs> about you. Oh, yeah. no, I forgot you were there. Yeah. <laughs> um, and and I, I remember just watching being thinking to myself, LA Galaxy are horrible. They're not a good team. <laughs> and and Car- and how good Carlos Vela is for the league for for LAFC. And you're you're watching the game and at the same time you're thinking, maybe they might not play slot on in this match because it's 3-0 and Probably doesn't make sense if he just got off the plane the night before. They put him in at 3-1, gives him an opportunity, and boy, did he show out. I remember just jumping on the couch and just thinking about how much of of an attraction Slatan Ibrahimovic is for the league, but also for just sports fans in general in this country. So that's why I was pumped about Slatan, about El Trafico, because like that, the the writer just just, uh, told us, he, can, he was a converted fan because of that game, because of Slatan, and that's what we want. We want to see this game grow in, in, in America. So a player like Slatan Ibrahimovic and the performances he had, that's only going to convert those, those sports enthusiasts to be uh, fans of the game. You never forget when you fall in love, right? And I, <laughs> fell. I fell for Slatan in that moment. He was my guy. Oh my I, just remember, I just remember like people saying – before that, he's going to be a flop. That this is a retirement league move. That this isn't going to work out. And it, in some ways, you know, you could be a doubter and a hater and have actual reason behind you because his knee was ravaged. He had kind of been hidden away in the Manchester United training room for the better part of a year before he got here. And for him to do that, and he said afterwards, "I could barely run. I didn't have any energy. I shot because I didn't want to actually try to go on goal." I mean, it, it was just crazy. It was crazy. It's a shot heard around the world. You know, a little different historical perspective, Doyle. But to me, that was something that it, it penetrated every single place soccer goes. You mm-hmm. you saw that. It's an iconic moment, not just for MLS, but for Zlatan. And Zlatan is, you know, one of the five best players of the past twenty years, probably. Uh, Zlatan, he- Zlatan, 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 and Zlatan, or yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I had to do it. Lucho Gonzalez, right? Is, right? Uh, yeah, something like that. Yeah, um, he he, uh, he delivered. It, it was great because he had like he had been Zlatan about the whole thing coming to MLS. Uh, you know, he what taken out the the ad in the LA Times the day before. Like you're welcome for being here, and then he scores that goal and then gets the game winner. It was it was an iconic moment. But Charlie's initial Charlie's initial instinct was correct. The Galaxy did stink. They were a terrible <laughs> team. They did not make the playoffs that year. Um, and they only barely made the playoffs last year. And I think that one of the things that was great about it was it set up this storyline for this great LAFC team, who I think we all agree is one of the best we've ever seen in MLS, having to struggle to get past this one-man show LA Galaxy side. Mm-hmm. Um It was not just a great goal. It was a preview of what was to come. You want to talk to somebody who uh, was there, who had a pretty good view for that one? That's Stephen Betashore. He was part of that expansion team, a starter for two years, including last year, that great, great LAFC team. Stephen, uh, welcome to Extra Time, another AT&T call to the field. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Let's start before the game, because I've been thinking about the Zlatan moment and all the buildup, but I want to rewind because... I, I want to understand what it was like in L.A. before this. We know what El Trafico is now. It's one of the most passionate, dramatic rivalries in this league. But beforehand, what was it? Like, as you tried to wrap your arms around what this could be before the game, take us inside that perspective. Honestly, before the first game, uh, it really felt like another match. Didn't feel like anything what it was about to be. Um you know, obviously they were our closest rival, but we haven't played them yet. You know, really didn't see outside noise from fans and other other stuff. It was just we're trying to prepare and, and trying to win another match. Uh, obviously, being an expansion club, um, you know, we, we played a couple games prior to that. We started off well, and we were trying to just carry that momentum. But uh, as far as the, the hatred and, you know, what it really means between two clubs that dislike each other, we didn't feel that until afterwards and uh yeah was bob trying was bob trying to play it down because bob's never really seemed like he just went all in on this thing always kind of felt like oh let's not put too too much into this thing 
Yeah, it didn't feel like he was trying to play it down. I honestly just think he was trying to make sure that we prepare properly and, and get ready regardless of if it was the Galaxy or, you know, someone like Montreal or someone like far away. It, it, it didn't matter uh, their proximity to us or the fact that, uh, you know, it was supposed to be our biggest rival. Um, I think all that got built up after we played them and after we continued to play them and uh, just because of the results and and then the fans really got into it after that. But beforehand, no, I don't think so. So like 3,000 fans showing up in camo because they were going to yeah. take the stadium like five hours before the game. Yeah. Did, did that not affect you guys at all? Did you go out to the field early to see the fans? Like, do you remember that? Well, we don't see them five hours before, but we definitely saw them when we went out for warm-ups. I couldn't believe it. That sight... When you're walking out, I think it's uh, the south end when you come through the tunnel and you see on the opposite corner, far left corner, the amount of LAFC fans. It was, yeah, it was unbelievable. And like the flags are waving and uh, man, they're chanting the entire time. And, you know, for that first game, for the first 60 minutes, that's all you heard. You know, you just heard our fans in their stadium, which is unheard of. Um, and it was pretty amazing. Uh, to set up the rivalry like that. Did you hear when Zlatan started to warm up? Like, you're playing, you're focused, but did you hear that? Because I remember the chanting from the home fans. I remember the moment he, like, rose from the bench and everyone kind of said, oh, my God, it's happening. He's coming yeah. in. But uh, I typically don't hear the fans when I'm playing. Uh, it's kind of just, like, white noise, kind of a little bit of, like, tunnel vision. And – Strangely, the, the obviously the two times that I heard uh, the fans were one when they scored the first goal, uh, and then it was when Zlatan was warming up. And uh, you know, you're like, why are these fans cheering right now? <laughs> Nothing's <laughs> happening. And then you know, it goes like up on the jumbotron. And if like if I went out to throw the ball or something, I kind of take a look, and you know, sure enough, he's warming up. I'm like, okay, wow, these guys are <laughs> really excited for Zlatan. So, spoiler alert, he comes in the game, he yeah. scores once or twice. <laughs> Sorry to take you there, but you have the view of the goal, right? You're yeah. kind of chasing behind. One, do you yeah. still think it was a foul? Because you that's your immediate reaction, is 100%. you think Ola fouled. <laughs> 100%. 100%. <laughs> and what did you make of the shot? Like, you saw that twist that Ben probably better than anyone in real life. Did you think it was going in? So, unfortunately, I had the best view in the house. It was, like, one of the places I didn't want to be, but it was a perfect view. Just, he struck it so well. Um, it's just so pure, the way he hit it. But before that, it's a foul. It's 100% a foul. <laughs> I'm, the, Tyler sends the ball to Stairs. Stairs heads it out, and... Naturally, when your center back goes up, you know, as outside backs, first of all, you get up and then you got to cover. So we're going to cover in, and, and uh, Dayan Yakovic just gets cleaned out by Kamara. And I'm like, okay, this guy's not looking at the ball once. He's just like looking at Yakovic and just crushes him. I'm like, okay, it's a foul. And I kind of put my hands up, like, hey. And I, I don't know if the ref puts his whistle in his mouth and is like, ready to blow it but then he sees Latan like winding up he's like oh maybe I shouldn't blow it right now because this could be amazing and sure enough it was amazing for them terrible for us so Stephen like most people who follow this league I remember where I was how I felt when that happened what I thought when the ball bounced and Zlatan's moving his feet and he's setting himself up and you're like oh god he's gonna do this and then when the ball hit the back of the net I'm pretty sure I ran in circles screamed expletives in front of my bosses and jumped on a couch what was the thought that went through your head when he struck it and it went and it hit the back of the net? When the ball bounced like that, I kind of knew he was going to strike it. I was like, oh, no. And at that point, you're not thinking that Tyler's in his goal because he just, you know, cleared the ball to their center back. So I was like, man, if he shoots this, this is probably going to go in. Uh, our luck, they just scored. Momentum was on their side. He just came on the field. I'm like, yeah, this is this is how it's gonna happen. A 40 yard banger, uh, and sure enough, when he hit it, it was just a perfect strike. Um, yeah, it was devastating, and I was screaming expletives and, and 
in my own mind as well. Did you have a feeling that that, that was it, that they were going to find a way? Or was there a sense of foreboding? Or was it just kind of like, all right, tie game, we'll find our way back, we had the momentum? Or was it, dear God, everybody just tackles Latan in mass so he doesn't do this again? Uh, you definitely felt the momentum just completely swing. The first one, they had a little bit of momentum, and then that happened, and you're just like... Yeah, this is this is not good. Just let's let's try to gather our our thoughts and our you know uh, our composure. And uh, but unfortunately, we didn't. And he struck again in the ninety fourth minute, I think. Uh, yeah, that was that was not fun. How much how much was the game talked about afterwards? And like over the last two years at LAFC, how much are oh. those moments brought up? As miserable as it is for anyone affiliated with LAFC, whether you're a player, fan, coaching staff, um, it was that monumental to the league, to to neutral fans, to their fans. Uh, it was just, it was an incredible first game. Uh, if you want to talk about rivalries that are years long, well, this was the first game. Are you kidding me? Like, <laughs> what more can a, a neutral fan ask for? And, you know, it was terrible, you know, and especially we have to relive that moment. But, <laughs> you know, I see all these random advertising slots on hitting a 40 yard shot. And I'm like, shoot, there I am, like going like this, <laughs> trying to run back. Like, no, that's a foul. No, get on your line. And yeah, it's one of those you have to to live. And, you, you know, it's uh, it's not going away anytime soon. Why was it so difficult for you guys to get over this hump with the Galaxy? Like what? What yeah. was it about them? Was it just Slaton? Was it sort of the aura that that game created? Was it inside your own heads? What was the difficulty? You know, if just that first year alone in, in 2018, if you look at the three games combined, I think we don't. I don't think we dominated for two thirds of each game, <laughs> completely dominated, and then just we made silly mistakes or or just uncharacteristic mistakes, and then momentum completely changed and they only needed 20 25 minutes to to punish us and meanwhile we were just dominating for 65 70 minutes uh of every single game so i don't think it was necessarily uh, something that was uh, you know sitting over our heads like oh man it's it's the galaxy why can't we beat them it was just mistakes and they really punished us and i don't think we necessarily punish them as much for being so dominant in those um, earlier minutes. I'm curious because you you mentioned the way those games play out. It reminds me of the Goonies and the things you guys would do to other teams. Yeah. But you're from San Jose. You played in the Cali Classicos. You played mm -hmm. in some wild ones. How do you compare and contrast these two rivalries and you know what it feels like as a player, but also what it looks like from a California native? Feel free to throw in the Canadian Classic as well. We're big Montreal yeah. Toronto stands too. Yeah, I, I've been fortunate to be part of the good end of some of these uh, <laughs> Classicos, and unfortunately, the the bad end. Um, yeah, just those earlier days at Stanford Stadium playing against the Galaxy, and uh, you know, being a man down, being down uh, a goal or two goals, and then coming back and winning like crazy stuff and it was probably you know what goes around comes around and they ended up uh beating us with when i was with lafc uh even though we were up three nothing so um i've had some crazy moments and the fans you know i always i always just uh kind of reflect to the, the fans when when something like that happens i remember at sanford stadium when we scored um uh, who was it al gordon scored the the goal when we were down a man uh, and down down a goal, and we came back and won when Marvin Chavez kind of shook up De La Garza. And when that goal happened, I just – I didn't run to, to, to everyone when they were celebrating. I just remember turning to the right and just looking at the fans, and I'll never forget that moment. Um, you know, there, there's some plays that just will always get stuck in your mind. And the goal was amazing, but I just remember looking up at the fans and people were just going absolutely bonkers and it was awesome. Um, and, you know, those feelings that you have, as great as they are, they're, you know, the other end of the spectrum, 
when you get scored on, when you're up three nothing and you get scored on one, two, three, and then the fourth and ninety fourth minute, you're just devastated and you're just kind of like, wow, did this really happen? So that's that's the beautiful game, you know. You take the highs and the lows, um, and you know, as a San Jose native, there's uh, not much more than <laughs> that you want than to beat the Galaxy, uh, but. Uh, yeah, there's some great, great moments. Also, Toronto, Toronto, Montreal. Those are <laughs> great rivalries as well. I still think back to that Toronto, Montreal one at Stade Olympique. I think it was when the lines were off. Yeah, yeah. Like that Tactics. was that, <laughs> that was incredible <laughs> stuff. So yeah. we're gonna do something. Man, we gotta do beta conspiracy corners. The Zlatan goal, no the lines in Montreal. Yeah. He's got some good but, ammo. That that playoff series uh, with Montreal and Toronto, that might have been the greatest playoff series, I think, in MLS history. That was one of the – I mean, I think between two legs, first of all, the, the highest attendance in MLS history, if I'm not mistaken. I mean, they packed uh, Olympiques, so that would put yeah. it – Six, yeah, it was 65,000. Yeah. 65,000. Toronto had 30,000. Yeah. And then the, the way it shaped up, you know, they were up – I think three nothing we came back three two at their place and we're coming back like we won because that's a you know that's a big victory to score two away goals and then come home and then the rain and then you know <laughs> fans like all the smoke bombs and it just felt like uh one of the best atmospheres i've been a part of you played for some really good teams we're doing our mount rushmore right now as well as the greatest mls team of all time trying to put together a bracket a couple of your squads will be on there but we're also in the mailbag going to put together our all loathed MLS 11, the guys that you love to play with, but hate when they're on the other team. And come on, Steven linhart has got to be there. But I want oh. your guy, Steven, <laughs> the guy for you on a different team, anywhere in the league that you were just like, this guy, I just don't like him. Put a name on that all loathed 11 for us. It's funny that you mentioned Lenhart. I'm like, he's probably on everybody's <laughs> list. I love Lenny. What a guy. But... I had to train against him as well. Don't forget that. You, you know, I heard. I heard he was a, just a savage in training. Yeah, him and Gordon, and you're like, yeah, we got Wanda on our team, but then we're going against uh, Lenny and Gordon, and you're just like, bloody nose, bloody lip. You're like, this is training. We got a game tomorrow. What's going on? <laughs> um, but for me, someone that I absolutely hate playing against. Oh gosh. Uh. I mean, I guess recently you'd have to throw Zlatan in there just because his antics are kind of similar to, to Lenny where he's just a fierce competitor. He's going to give you a couple cheap shots, um, but he's also very big and strong and there's not much you can really do uh, to affect him or throw him off his game. And then he scores the goals where just like, yeah, he talks the talk, but then he backs it up. Uh, so just, you know, I can't, I don't want to waste too much time thinking of, every single player that i've played against that i absolutely hate but uh i pretty much hate all forwards that i play against gotcha. Beta, first of all respect for coming on this show because andrew weeby is the largest lots on fan in the united states no so worries. thank no you worries. for taking that time also give us the update on you because the mls season started obviously on a postponement now uh yeah. you've been the starting right back for three sports shield winners in the last few years what do you what's your plans what's going to happen yeah, I've been fortunate to to be on some really good teams with some uh, you know some great leadership and fortunate to hold up some trophies. I know a lot of guys go throughout their career and either haven't won MLS Cup or even held uh, any trophies in particular. So uh, definitely been been uh, fortunate to to be on those teams. But right now, you know, free agent. Um, it's pretty crazy with what's going on in the world, not just with MLS. Uh, so my first thought is just, uh, you know, everybody be safe, uh, self-isolation, um, you know, wash your hands and just don't, don't be careless right now. It's a, it's a crazy time. So that's for sure my, my first thought. Um, and then it, it goes to, yeah, uh, you know, obviously I'm still, still looking to play. Hopefully I got another good three, four years. Um, uh, but, you know, there was some talks to, to go play in Iran. Some people thought I signed over there. It was pretty crazy. They, they, they changed my transfer market. I didn't even know you could do that. Uh, <laughs> saying that I'm playing over there. My uncle's calling my dad like, hey, I <laughs> uh, hear Steve's uh, signed in Iran. When's he going? I was like, what? <laughs> um, you know, we, we had some talks with, with China, but it's it's crazy. You know, things happen for a reason. You know, it was I was telling you guys earlier, uh, we had a really good offer with an Iranian team. And uh, the very next day, 
you hear about the news about uh, Trump killing one of the uh, generals, Free Ron. And so obviously the, the talk stopped, you know, being a U.S. Uh, born and raised player, going to Iran is not going to happen. You know, I don't know if I'm going to be let in over there or be let in when I'm back. So couldn't do that. Um, and then the whole China thing with uh, coronavirus, you know, it was, it was just in the beginning of it. Like, oh, is it really safe to go there right now before it had come over here to spread to Italy? So, um, you know, I think ideally I want to stay in MLS. Um, so hopefully there, there are some teams that um, still know that I'm available, a, a veteran that, you know, has been fortunate to be on some good teams that could help them. So that's that's where I'm at right now. Somebody go sign Stephen Bateshire. Come on, just look at the resume, people. Look at the resume. Can I ask you one question? You've got a golden touch. You've got a green thumb. Before we let you go. <laughs> I don't have any touch. I just got a, a little lucky, uh, yeah, lucky no, spell around you, th- you, were throwing some sh- you were throwing some shade, though. It was like very subtle, though. You're like, hey, look, a lot of players, they don't ever lift. They don't even touch a trophy. Yeah. Don't even get the happy <laughs> fingertips. They've been all over every trophy in MLS. You know what was depressing when you guys put out these uh, these stats about like the most winning and all this stuff, and I'm like, man, this is cool. And then I'm like, I still haven't signed. This is kind of depressing. <laughs> <laughs> and earlier, you guys put like, oh, this person's won this and that and uh, the best percentages. And I'm like, man, I want here again, but uh, shoot, I still haven't signed. So thanks, guys. Thanks for yeah, uh, we're working on it. rubbing we're, it in. We're doing our best. Any GMs, if you're listening to this yeah, show, if yeah. you're just like, ah, right back could use a little bit of a upgrade, Stephen Betisher, available for you. Before we let you go, Stephen, I do have to ask you because I'm a nerd in this way. I want to know how you ended up playing for Iran because you got called into the U.S. with Klinsman briefly, and it was like a surprise yeah. call up. And then Carlos Quiros, he must have convinced you. You went to a World Cup in 2014. How did all that go down? Yeah, that was pretty crazy. Uh, when I started playing with the San Jose Earthquakes, uh, I think it was 2011, uh, the Iran national team, Omid Namazi, specifically their assistant coach, who was. Uh, I don't think born in the States, but was raised in the States. And he really was pushing to get me in. And the paperwork just took forever, uh, as you can imagine, you know, with, with Iran or with the U.S. It just takes a long time. And and then finally in 2012, I got my first call up to, to the game in Azteca where U.S. beat, uh, beat Mexico for the first time ever in, at their place. And I didn't go in, so I didn't get cap tied. Um, and then comes – the January camp and I got called in again in 2013 for January camp, but unfortunately I had played the second half of that 2012 supporter shield team with the quakes with the sports hernia. And it was pretty bad because I played, I think about four months with it. Um, and it just, it just kept getting worse and worse and worse. And so my, my tear, my sports hernia tear was pretty bad. Um, I went in for surgery right when the season ended and unfortunately it wasn't fixed. I went into the camp and I just, I knew I, I couldn't move. And, you know, uh, I always kind of embraced the speed that I had. And if I don't have my speed, I'm like, yeah, I can't, I can't do much. And so I went in for another surgery this time with the national team doctors and, you know, they put some mesh in it and fixed it up. And it took me a couple months to get back to playing. So I missed the first seven games with the quakes. And then after that, I played every single game the rest of the season um and we really if you look at our record in 2013 our second half of the season you know i think we were on a support shield uh pace but um i think klinsman sent me a message after the first or second game and he's like oh it's good to see your back you look good and all this stuff and i'm like okay that's perfect he's watching but then i didn't hear from him or the national team and there was games that the players were going in and i just wasn't getting called up and Meanwhile, Iran is still like calling every month, like, hey, we still want you. Hey, we still want you. And then I think it was towards the, you know, the end of the summer where they're like, hey, we need to know, you know, you're you're going to be our guy for the World Cup. We really want you. Um, we need to know. And so I'm like, look, if, if U.S. isn't calling, then, you know, yeah, I, I really want to go to World Cup. So the World Cup really drove me to to play for Iran, um, you know, in hindsight, you know, hindsight being 2020, I probably should have stuck it out with the, the U.S. I think I could have a lot more caps in, in years to come. But, um, you know, when you're young and when you're, when you're making decisions, you don't know that, you know, you don't have a crystal ball to look at. Um, so, yeah, that's how it kind of came up.
We'll have to get some more stories from you on Iran at a later date. I have so many questions for you. <laughs> Last one. You going to watch these uh, replays of El Trafico? You going to settle down in front of the TV tonight, FS1 on Monday, and then MLSsoccer.com tomorrow afternoon, Tuesday? Yeah, it's, to it's tough. I've been seeing a lot of my past teams saying they're posting this game or that game. You know, uh, Obviously, LAFC has been putting some of their past games. Um, and then – Toronto has been, been doing the same with Montreal. So I've been trying to stay away from them because it just – it as great of memories it brings at the same time, I just want to get back on the pitch. And I know everyone's in self-isolation right now, but for me specifically, uh, not not being called in with the team, not having a preseason, it's been a longer self-isolation for me. Mm. And so I'm sick of my gym downstairs. I go to it every day, and I just want to see a field and, and start doing what I love. So uh, to answer your question, probably not. I'm sorry. <laughs> but, uh, but, yeah, I just want to get on the field. That's it. Un- understandable, man. Stephen Betasher, yeah. currently without a team. Someone changed that. Someone changed that, all right? Thanks for joining us, man. We appreciate yeah. your time. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Stay safe out there, guys. All right. Well, we'll do the uh, all Iran version of this podcast at a later date, Dave. Or we'll just buy Steven a beer and some hummus and uh, and pull it out of him. <laughs> How's that sound? Yeah, I'm there for it. I've had really good Iranian food in L.A. before. So I'm all here right. for it. Steven, we're on our way. Just know that. All right, let's do our Mount Rushmore here. We knocked out Houston. We knocked out D.C. We knocked out Toronto. All four players up on the mount, as well as their greatest teams of all time, which we'll throw on a bracket at a later date. I just do want to put out a, a little addendum to that. It's a 32-team bracket, not just 24. I'm calling it the GMTAT. Actually, I'm throwing that away right now. We'll never call it that again. So that means there are eight <laughs> at-large teams. So please, send us your candidates for the at-large bids. They can be any double up. So like if you have multiple, let's say, I'm not going to say Toronto, maybe Toronto, but Houston teams, DC teams, throw those in the fusion. Well, they have to be double ups. We we're giving every other team one. Yeah. FC Cincinnati gets one. So if they get one, <laughs> unless you just these... want to give it to Northern Iowa and Ali Farik, uh, Luke wow. Chinesh, whatever his wow. name is. We're yeah, talking that, brackets, uh, Weeby. We're talking was, upsets. That was, that was, that was mean. That was not right. The Toronto Duck has this to say about our Toronto one. He's never been so offended in his life. The recency bias against Danny Dicchio is amazing. You guys better address this. (laughs) We did address it. We did address the Toronto Duck. Danny Dicchio doesn't belong on the Mount Rushmore for Toronto. Danny Dicchio is the... He, he's the definitive cult hero. Like there's a different there's a different rubric. M- Mount Rushmore is for or the Pantheon. I don't like calling him Mount Rushmore. The Pantheon is for for the greats. Danny Dicchio meant a lot to that team, a team that stunk. And the fans are right to remember him, but they should also remember that that team did nothing. And the guys who belong in the Pantheon are the guys who have done something in MLS. Bradley, Javinko, Josie, Jonathan Osorio, arguably Justin Morrow, a few others from recent years. I right. disagree with Doyle on the main premise, but I agree with him on the Toronto point, so I'm going to leave it. All right, You let's disagree just... with the main premise. That's yeah. because you, you root for the Knicks and just you root saying. for the Jets. You Get only root for terrible teams. These are, these are the fan favorite players as well as no. just the great ones because – no. There are great players on bad teams. When it's this is not rings culture only, okay? I'm but, not talking about rings culture. But, I'm talking about don't be the worst team in the history sure. of the league. And Danny culture. Dicchio, it's not like Danny Dicchio scored 40 goals for a bad team. He was just fun and he, he scored the only goal. Goal. He, he had 14 goals Zlatan. in three years. He wasn't yeah. slot on, okay? Yeah. We've right. given Danny uh, too Danny much airtime as it is. Speaking of rings culture, Whoa, it's LAC and the Galaxy. And one of those has rings and one of them doesn't. We'll start with a team that doesn't. LAFC. You got to start with Carlos Vela, right? The Porter Shields this- counts, Andrew. It matters. It does matter, but it's not an MLS Cup, David. It's better. Yes. Thank you, Doyle. This is this is quite the, oh, the podcast yeah. here. Carlos Vela starts <laughs> us. Who wants to – do we need to talk about Carlos Vela here or do we just get the chisel out and call it good? Light your candles. Chisel out just and call chisel. it good. Yeah. Yeah. No, All right. no he's debate. chiseled he's done yeah. what what hair are we going with the man bun are we going with the like little ponytail what kind well, of I'm definitely going with the uh, canadian tuxedo i'm i'm digging the hairstyle right now the door like, that's okay. long enough that it can be all slicked all the way back. Gotcha. So it's the without full the slick one, back. Without one piece, just like <laughs> <laughs> constantly getting in the face. Oh, uh, yeah. But that's that, you know, you can brush it out of the way. Yeah. But some... it, then you got to do it constantly throughout 90 minutes. Like, <laughs> not about Diego, that. How about Diego Rossi? Is he a, is he a chisel it? Just do it? Yes. Yes. Okay. Chiseled in. That's two, the two top scores. And that's where it gets a little bit complicated after this. And Doyle, I'll let you start. 
Who are you putting up there? You can choose from, I want to say, like, Eddie Atuesta could be there. Latif Blessing could be there. Mark yeah. Anthony Kay could. Walker, Walker Zimmerman, Zimmerman, despite him getting traded. I mean, you could even throw Jordan Harvey in there, maybe. Who are you going with? I'm going with Atuesta. I, I think we can all agree that he – I mean, of all those guys we named, they all have cases, but Atuesta has been – one of the best players in the entire league at his position for two straight years. He's been mostly healthy. Um, he's had some big moments. Of course, he did have his worst game in two years in that game against Seattle, but that happens with young players. Uh, I, it's To me, this one's actually kind of easy. At West, it has to be up there. Agreed. Chisel I agree as well. All right, that's four of us. Put it up. This is where it's get hard. Are you going to go Zimmerman yeah. for what he meant? Because he has that, like, he has both the leader, the captain, the cult appeal, and also some big moments. Latif Blessing definitely right. has the cult appeal. I'm going to cut you off here. I'm going to go first. Not going to say everyone's going to agree, but I'm going to go Mark Anthony K. I I think, one, the style he plays with, and when they are at their best, when they are the, you know, Barcelona of MLS or whatever it is they hope to be, it's when he's – you know, getting into gaps between the midfield and the back line when he's making aggressive passes, when he's changing the game. I also think, and I could be wrong of the way I judge it, he was the first, I think, that came out and it was like, Bob's going to take players who haven't done things before in new positions, in new yep. pressures, and he's going to elevate them to a national team level, basically. I think he was the first guy we really saw that with, and the injury to him probably changed the way 2018 ended for them. Um, so I put him on that list for what he represents, I think, for the future of the club and, and what he's done, but also purely as a player. I love watching him play. When he's on, I think he's one of the most entertaining central midfielders in the league. He's also got that fire in his belly where he kind of, he brought he brought like a personality to them that they didn't always have when he wasn't on the field. But I think you can make that same argument for Latif Blessing. Maybe he hasn't had the national team caps that Mark Heathy K has gotten. But Latif Blessing went from base, went from basically like a, a late game sub for Sporting Kansas City, like a, a firework off the bench, to one of the most unplayable central midfielders in MLS, just on his pressure, on his ball recovery, on his ability to find the right pass and still score goals as well. I think he's third behind Rossi and Vela in all time appearances for LAFC. And he's he is definitely in that same boat of like Bob Bradley sees a diamond in the rough. He brings him in, and he pushes him, pushes him, pushes him, and now all of a sudden he's Andres Iniesta. And that happened by, by mistake. Just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm just I'm kidding. Yeah, it was it was Lee Wynn's injury that caused Bob Bradley to change Latif Blessing's role, insert him in the midfield, and then he never looked back. He looked like he had played there his whole career. He, the way he gets forward, he breaks up plays, wins the second balls. His ability to close down that distance between an attacker or the next player who's going to make the the play, it's fantastic. So, argument arguing for Latif Blessing or Mark Anthony K, absolutely. But I'm going to go with Walker Zimmerman. What he's meant to that team over the course of two years, yeah, it's it's tough because they traded, <laughs> they traded him after these two years. He's got to be on Mount Rushmore because of what he's done for the club. In, in two seasons. Doyle, I think it's time for you to, to make a decision that either we all get behind or we all pan. We've uh, got Latif, we've got yeah. Walker, yeah. and we've got uh, Mark Anthony. I think I would agree with Charlie if they did, hadn't just traded Walker Zimmerman. Like, if he was still on LAFC, then he would be the choice because he was a best 11 center back last year, but he's gone. They didn't think he was worth keeping so like he's not mount rushmore i do think it's mark anthony k and it's um he's been arguably the best player in the league at his position for the last two years he is hurt by the fact that as david said his injury in 2018 changed that team for the worse and then the same thing happened in 2019 like if he's healthy against seattle i don't think they give up both of those goals uh, or, or all three of those goals i think that maybe that's a different game um but even that said, in all due respect to Latif for what he did last year, it, it's got to be Mark Anthony K. Um, he's the one who, as David said, changed the, or made you realize Bob Bradley was going to change the way that we think about certain players, and he's certainly held up his end of the bargain. I'm willing to go along with with Doyle's uh, summary judgment here. 
Charlie, can you get behind this, or you, you feel feel like you want to throw a caveat in there? I'm a little upset. I am a little, <laughs> I'm a little upset. <laughs> Listen, Charlie, I agree with your whole argument. The one pushback on Latif is he was 19, 20. Like he wasn't. Uh, Mark Anthony K got cut from TFC two, and was mm-hmm. playing in USL as a winger, and now is, as Doyle said, arguably the best box to box midfielder at times in MLS. So that's the only reason that I think. I agree with you on Latif. He was a winger, and now all of a sudden he's this incredible short passing, connecting central midfielder. But he had, you know, the the arc to a career that you'd somewhat expect, where Mark Anthony K sort of changed things and is an example of that. I think you also have to make a decision in these Mount Rushmores, where especially with teams that are brand new, in many ways that LAFC is, kind of have to look to the future and say, okay, we're making this right now, but who's most likely to kind of maintain? that level and to rise in the eyes of both the fans and the league. And Mark Anthony K probably feels like that player, right? If ever, I'm not, if, being, you know, I'm not being forced into this decision. <laughs> fine. It's fine. We've already got the happy. majority three to one. That's a solid majority. Mark Anthony well, K goes I'm, up. I'm going to be unhappy in. as this is being etched out. I'm going to be unhappy sitting. Here I'm, I'm just going to shout out Eddie Segura with though, though, by the way, yeah, Eddie for Segura sure. could push his way into this real quick over the next year or two. He also could be gone in a year as well. And then, He's a great player, but where do you yeah. stand in history? Yeah, hey, Diego Rossi could be gone as well, but he scored so many big goals. There you have it. Yeah. You have Carlos Vela, Charlie Candle gets up there first. Probably make his like double or triple we the size. Yeah, of else. Four different images of Carlos Vela. That's the that's the pantheon for uh, LAFC. Probably, probably. I'll, I'll drag my kid out of the picture here if he ever runs in. Anybody who's watching <laughs> on YouTube just saw Doyle move a tabby cat out of the way. <laughs> so you have Carlos Vela, Diego Rossi. Um, why can't I remember the third? Eddie I'm Atuesta. Eddie Atuesta. And then uh, at the very end, Mark Anthony K pushing in. And it's a 2019 team. Like, yeah. greatest team of all time, directly into the bracket. Do we even need to discuss it? Probably not. You all experienced it, saw it, heard ad nauseum from us all of last season into this season about 2019 LAFC. They join uh, our other teams in that bracket, which we'll push out on Twitter. Extra time. Let's do the Galaxy. They got some rings. They got five of them. They're still trying to do their mm-hmm. race to Sace thing. But uh, I think I think that the Mount Rushmore for the LA Galaxy makes itself. I don't even think you need to think about this. Ooh. You start in That's one place. Definitely wrong. <laughs> what? Okay, I'm okay. Pick it apart. Then I'm starting here. Kobe Jones has to be on the Mount Rushmore for the LA Galaxy. Number one in appearances. Agree. He was there for the lean years when they were almost there, not quite. He was there when they started winning MLS Cups. Kobe Jones. He's iconic. He defined the club for long periods. He was an incredible player. Put him up there, start there, and then you got to go straight to Landon Donovan, in my opinion. He is in so many ways the Galaxy. I know he had his Quakes years. I know they were very successful there. I know there were some hurt feelings when he went to L.A., but he made it pretty clear what he thought he was in his heart, and that was an L.A. Galaxy member, and he really ushered in those incredible years as well. Then another no-doubter for me, Robbie Keane. Arguably the best player in the league during his time on the most dominant teams. He helped elevate those Donovan and Beckham teams to championship teams, to supporter shield winning teams. The best goal scorer in MLS at that time, maybe ever. And here's where the debate comes in. For me, no doubt, Salvadorian legend Mauricio Simfuegos has to be your fourth. Nope. There from the very beginning, more than 200 <laughs> games, one of the best number 10s nope. in the league, right there with Marco Echeverri and others. And, and Valderrama during those early years, he is in so many ways L.A., whether it be the Salvadorian community there, the way he is integrated into the club. He's now an academy coach. For me, it's those four guys. And Charlie, I you're forget. already beefing I with forget. Me. Do they have a statue of him outside the stadium? I, can't, <laughs> I, I don't know. For, that, for the life of me, I can't they remember sh- that. They should, Charlie. They should. Put okay? David Beckham's mug right up there next to Landon. Uh, next to Keen and and next to Kobe Jones because David Beckham's got to be the fourth guy up there. What he Make meant the to the league, what he meant to the league, how he changed the league, how he changed this is LA a, Galaxy, this- how he changed LA Galaxy. You cannot argue that when he came to LA Galaxy, he elevated the club to a new stratosphere. You can't, but you cannot argue that he was as good on the field as like Juninho. Like the team, the team got better when they replaced David Beckham in the lineup with Mauricio Sarvas. Come on now, 
don't they be did. silly. They did. Don't, be, don't be silly. You got, your, you got your Mauricio's confused because it's Marcelo Sarvas. Mar- Marcelo Sarvas. <laughs> no, no respect to our, to our favorite Brazilian midfielder that made his disrespect. name in Costa Rica, all right? That is absolute disrespect. I cannot believe you said that. I but mean, here's the thing. Charlie, yeah. he, he, the first couple years were a disaster. Like, we're I think even about Beckham Mal would admit here. that. Yeah, we are. So overall contributions to the club. Mauricio Sinfuegos, he was the club for like the first six years. Overall contributions, not only on the pitch, off the pitch as well. You don't yeah, think Charlie, that? Okay. Say, Charlie definitely say has so. argument. Charlie definitely has argument in that the when Beckham came, it changed them into the more modern version of who they were at their peak, right? Obviously, you had the 98 to 02 teams, and then Beckham is the future, although he played terrible for three years or wasn't even there. He's not all of that. So I get what Charlie's saying in terms of the perception of the club. Basically, Zlatan probably doesn't go there if Beckham had never gone there. And I think part of what they've Correct. created as modern yeah, galaxy that's a fact. is the Beckham effect. But go ahead, keep doing your tea. At yep. the same time, he's right. He was not the best player on the team. He wasn't the second. He may not have even been the third best player on the team when they won their trophies. And if they lose in 2011, I mean, his time's a failure because of the way it played out. They win that game. He comes back. They win a second one. And it changes our perception from there on. Can I just make this argument to to you, Charlie? That what really turned the page for the Galaxy into the modern era was Bruce Arena. Because making them a serviceable team, and not just serviceable, one of the best in the league by making the right draft picks, the right signings, whether it's a Saravas or a Juninho or otherwise, mm-hmm. that's what transitioned them. Now, this is a weird instance yeah, in my but opinion. Then, but we're not putting managers on uh, Mount Rushmore. Sure, sure. And from the Bruce Arena observation deck, Bruce Arena is saying, put I, actually, I can't put any words in Bruce Arena's mouth. I'm not. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Rewind, rewind, rewind. It's weird because you would put, and I, I probably would too, put David Beckham on the MLS Mount Rushmore yep. players, but I don't think I would put him on the LA Galaxy. You can't do that. You can't, Mount you can't Rushmore. Do that. You can't do that. No, sure you can. You can't, you can't, say, he's he's you can't say he's Mount Rushmore MLS, but he can't be Mount Rushmore LA it's Galaxy. It's like saying Come he's a Hall of now. Famer, but not a Hall of Famer on his, like, you don't retire. Yeah, he's a Hall of Famer, but we, we don't hang his jersey in yeah. the rafters. Uh, so, come on now. Can I throw out one that you all just shoot down? Does Omar get any <laughs> argument in this? Three yeah. MLS Cups, yeah, base does. of that team. Yeah. Uh, three MLS Cups, two uh, two supporter shields. Uh, he, he was – Omar Omar was arguably a more important piece of that team being what they were. Uh, than anybody but Landon or Keane. What about um, Todd D- Todd Dunavant? Does he get a shot? Todd, I mean, no. He was he was a good left back for a long time, but he wasn't that key. Um, Kevin Hartman. Kevin Hartman was Kevin, awesome, but no. Kevin he Hartman. Be in the combo. Greg he be in the combo, but not there. Greg no. Vanny. No. I would put Robin Frazier over Greg Vanny. Yeah, I think Vanny and Frazier are behind Omar because Omar yeah. was there longer. For Caleb. his career, Caleb. The other, the other one would be Carlos Ruiz. Carlos yes. Ruiz has a, has a claim because it, the Galaxy, the first six years of the league, were kind of like everybody's favorite punching bag because it was like, oh, you guys are great in the regular season, but you're just going to choke in the playoffs again and again and again, especially after 2001 when they lost to the Quakes, which was huge for that rivalry. Well, in 2002 happens, and Carlos Ruiz had um, maybe the best – single year in terms of what one player did for the team that anybody had had until Joseph Martinez in 2018. Uh, he scored, you know, he, he won the golden boot. He scored over half their goals. He mm-hmm. scored something like 75% of their goals in the playoffs. Then he scored the game winning goal in MLS cup itself. The only oh, goal. In MLS don't cup. Stop. Oh, that one hurt. <laughs> I was there too. Oh. <laughs> um, it was, he was awesome. So he has a claim based on that. Uh, but it's, I mean, that's what makes this discussion so tough with the galaxy. So we have uh, Dylan Robert on Twitter who hit us up and said, if Ibra makes it, this show is forever a farce. I was surprised Stay you strong. didn't start with him. Yeah. Well, no, Ibra, come on. He didn't Ibra, win. Yeah. Ibra and, and that's why Wait, and Charlie, you don't have to argue to me. You're the Charlie, one. When you bring up, when you bring up Ibra's name in relation to Beckham, I didn't I bring up, I did not, I did not bring I up Ibra. It was, yeah. it was God. Oh. Okay, yeah. there's some confusion here. This yeah. whole Skype thing, it gets difficult <laughs> <Yeah>. to track. <laughs> we don't have an on Skype who anymore. Am attacking? Who am I? Yeah, whatever. Whatever the new the new product is. But look, he didn't win. 
And to be on this, you have to win. And that's why Beckham, I think, has a legitimate argument. For sure. But Cienfuegos does too, because I think in more ways, to me at least, Cienfuegos is more the soul of the club than that's than David Beckham would be the quote unquote soul of the club. Does that make sense? Like he's part I of see the where formation. You're trying to go, but <laughs> <laughs> Charlie definitely has a pretty big veto stamp with this statue outside the stadium of one of the like, guys. Like, pass it to the left. Seriously. <laughs> okay. Seriously. How many Are David Beckham? Uh, all right. It's up to you two then. Charlie and I made ourselves clear. Doyle, Goss, who wait is a the minute, wait, a, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Charlie, what one club do you associate David Beckham with? Everyone, Not one MLS I think, club. I think, I think so, who cares? What does it matter? What does that matter? Don't, don't dodge the question, Just Charlie. Answer the question, Charlie. <laughs> Just answer the question. What one club do you associate David Beckham with? I think everyone would agree it's Manchester United. Oh, okay. That's that's interesting. Please continue, sure. Andrew. Well, I think that case has been made. On the MLS Mount Rushmore. I'm overruling that you here, is, Charlie. That is just a horrible, horrible <laughs> case. <laughs> I think what this might be do? the toughest one we've had. I think so too. If, if you think about Robbie Keane, tell me what club you call oh, mind when you oh, associate Robbie oh. Keane. I, Thank you. He, I don't even know what club he played no, no, for bad. before the Galaxy. The LA Galaxy. It was some. He was with some small feeder club from in the North Island London. I, 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 I don't know. know. <laughs> it's some some irrelevant club from North London. I can't so, even like, remember he their never, name. He uh, never won a trophy, but he never won a single so trophy good, before guys, he came huh? to the Galaxy. God, so. I just feel so good when you just. I mean, you know, it's, <laughs> it's kind of like him and, and Dimitar Berbatov. Like, who oh. are you going to take? I'm going to take Berbatov personally. Sorry, Robbie. Uh, we've got the three. We've decided here via producing Anders that we're going to put this to a fan vote. That way, there can be no illusions I know of the wrongdoing. Fans are with me. I know the LA fans are with me. All right, we'll Gosh, find you're out. With won't me we? Too, aren't you? I am not with you. It's close, Thank but you. I am not with you. <laughs> Wait, so who is your fourth, David? I would say Cienfuegos as well. Oh. For all the arguments everyone has made, it's 4951. I get Charlie's point. The fact that there's a statue of him outside is really hard to get past. But uh, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I. I Again, back to my unring sculpture. I, I I agree with the concept that CM Fuegos is more the soul of the team. He's more associated with the club. Um, but yeah, it's really tough. Look, one of them is the owner now of a different MLS team, and the other one is a coach in the academy bringing up the next generation. I don't think so, he is anymore. That, just, just FYI. That, well, that, that was that, a, point, that point also is irrelevant as well. <laughs> okay, fine. Let's move wait, on. Wait, the guy who made there. the guy who said the overall contribution is what matters. Or just yeah, saying? if 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 CM Fuegos could own a team, I I guarantee you <laughs> he's going to be owning a team. <laughs> Man, Vegas. All right, you know what I'm How saying. How about this? How about who's the best? What's the best Galaxy team of all time? You have five MLS Cup winners in this group, but some of them uh, regular season wasn't so great. I think to me, the two that are pretty clear that you have to put head to head and feel free to disagree, Charlie. I know we're on that, that tip is 2002 first in the West supporter shield winners, MLS cup winners against uh, the new England revolution. And then I think it's 2011 supporter shield MLS cup against the dynamo. The first of the back to backs, both based on regular season and postseason. but Robbie Keane, I don't know. Didn't I think that 14 team, for me. You think 14? Oh, I, played, I, played against, I played against Who both. Who wasn't on that 14 against, team? I played against 2011 <laughs> and I played against 2014. Yeah. Uh-huh. So this is a, this is your argument for Marcelo Sarvas getting onto Mount Rushmore then? No, it's not. <laughs> um, that I think it's between the 02 team and the 2014 team. Wait, so what was the difference you felt on the field between 2011 and 2014? Uh, I just felt that they were more of a unit. I felt like they... They played on both sides of the ball together. It, there was it wasn't so much we're just going to counter or we're just going to play. You know, the four guys are going to stay high, and then the we're going to have five guys sit back. They felt like they were one unit. They would defend together. They would attack together. They were a little bit more dynamic. And that fourteen team, I remember watching how Robbie Keane was able to 
get from one side of the pitch to the other to unlock defenses. He'd, he'd pull, you know, center backs into midfield. He could drop deep and he could be a playmaker. I would just remember being awe in awe of his movement. And that's what separated Robbie Keane from, from everyone else was how influential he was in the grand scheme of things to, to be able to bark orders at, at players and for them to take it in a positive manner and react in the right way, but also scoring goals from distance, he, chipping uh, keepers, dribbling keepers, uh, making the right pass, the right decision, and just expecting uh, everyone to, to play at a higher level. He brought the best out of everybody. So that 14 team was special. And obviously they beat us in the MLS Cup final, uh, which left a sour taste in, in, in our mm -hmm. mouth. But um, it, that it was a remarkable team. And, and I, I think they – probably get the the nod let me let me just say i, I wrote about this last week because we actually showed the 2011 mls cup last week and we had to do a little bit on what made that team special um so the 2011 team uh bah, 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 they had 12 one goal wins throughout the course of the entire season they gave up only 28 goals all year long. Um, only one team since then has given up fewer than 28 goals as a 2012 uh, Sporting KC team. Uh, they won uh, their first game of the playoffs 1-0. They won their second 2-1, and they won their final game of the playoffs 1-0 in MLS Cup itself. Only two players scored goals for that 2011 team in the playoffs. It was Landon with three, two of them penalties, uh, one of them the game winner in MLS Cup, and the other one was Mike McGee. Keen didn't even score in the playoffs. The 2014 team had more multi-goal wins during like a 15-game stretch after Landon got cut from the national team uh, than the 2011 team had the entire year, including into the playoffs. They were just a better team. The reason that they didn't win the double is because the first two months of the season, Landon and Keane and a few other guys were kind of saving themselves for the World Cup. They, they, were, were, they were sipping coffee. Yeah, they really weren't going after the shield. But there's like – and like people have their opinions about Jossie Zardes. Jossie Zardes has been a double-digit scorer in MLS four years now. He started and scored in that MLS Cup against you guys, Charlie – in the 2011 MLS Cup, they started Adam Christman at center forward. And if you go back and you watch that 2011 MLS Cup, they were all over Houston for almost the entire 90 minutes. If it had been Jossie's artist instead of Adam Christman, they'd win that game 3-0. But it wasn't. It wasn't. One guy was a fringe MLS player. The other guy is a guy who's going to end up scoring 100 MLS goals. Mm -hmm. 2014 team was better, even though even though they didn't win the double. The 2014 team was absolutely. I mean, and, and we're talking about splitting hairs. I mean, they they lost by what three points to the Seattle Sounders. Yeah, and that yeah, Seattle and Sounders team was awesome. also fantastic. That Seattle yeah. that Seattle team in the pre Tam era, that Seattle team was arguably a top five MLS team of all time, and they're back and forth against the Galaxy at the end of the season, and then in the playoffs. Those Western Conference Finals, like we still might not have had a playoff series played at that level. I was rooting for Seattle because then we get we we would have <laughs> got the MLS Cup at, at Foxborough Gillette Stadium, which would have been amazing. So no, you wouldn't. Yeah. It would have it would have been a Seattle. Oh, I thought we were going to get no. It. Seattle won the Shield, so it would have been a it would have been a Seattle. <laughs> yeah. Now we know. Now we know that Charlie just twists history for his own <laughs> nefarious <laughs> reasons. I'm uh, fine to give it. I'm fine to give it the 2014. It's easy to get caught up in sort of the trophy count and the supporters' shields, but I think you guys are right. As far as a team go, you just run them out on the field on a given day. That is a better team, and they had extenuating circumstances with the World Cup, mm -hmm. with the fact that they'd already won the shield. They didn't need to win that to validate themselves. They just needed to do it at the end of the year. MLS Cups. Dave, one argument one? against it from a pure personnel point of view, and I agree with what Charlie said. I thought the 2014 teams were more cohesive. They had a lot of talent around the field. They did start AJ De La Garza at right back and therefore started Leonardo at center Leonardo. back, who is <laughs> arguably one of the worst starting center backs in MLS history. Uh, while in 2011, AJ started at center back and Sean Franklin started at right back, who I think was an upgrade. Now, 2014, they had Robbie Rogers at left back. After he finally found his feet at that position, he was one of the best attacking fullbacks in the league. So I, I think there's a million arguments both ways. I thought on the field, watching them play the way they played, 
I thought they were better in 2014 and everything Charlie said from experiencing it is exactly what I saw. But there is the Leonardo thing that stands out. So All right. That. Well, that's what we have at large bids. So, Galaxy <laughs> fans, what's the second best team in the history of your club? Maybe even the third. You might get a couple on there. Let us know. 401-206-0MLS. We've now got five teams Mount Rushmore set. We have five greatest teams of all time in there. We will seed and get the at-large bids at a later date. Uh, Dave, you were going to help us pick two more clubs, yeah. were you not? You had some sort of so, randomization. Device. I have a randomized list. I was going to do it based off the numbers Charlie wore on different teams he played for, but because he's a you know selfish and you know nine, swag nine, individual, ten. he only wore the number nine and ten, which doesn't really give me that much. So Doyle, how old's Taquito? Uh, Taquito is six years old. Uh, so one of our teams is going to be Atlanta. Okay. Oh, nice. For Charlie, which number do you want to pick, Charlie? Nine or ten? Nine. Uh, so one of our teams will be RSL. And Weeby, what number did you wear in baseball or soccer? Or uh, anything well, I, you play? I, I wore six, so we've already done that nine. one. Okay, then never mind. We'll scratch that one. General So is 14. Go, go General So is 14, so we'll go Vancouver. All right. So our teams are Ooh, Atlanta. That one's going to be tough. Atlanta, <laughs> RSL, and Vancouver. There you Sab go. Sab Sabarillo and... Uh, we're doing this on the later show. I, uh, I know, yeah. but I, I I get to talk about Sabri Charlie. Charlie, Charlie wants to make it Beckham again. Charlie wants to make it Beckham <laughs> for RSL too. Hey, RSL no, had a pretty Miami. big place to play in the Beckham legacy. They, they did. Do. So did Robbie Russell, who I just want to again say big thanks to for joining the show and Stephen Betasher. Here's a couple of tastes from the mailbag before we get out of here. Colt from Topeka. What's up, man? Kansas TID. Uh, he says he's on the treadmill for a morning run, listening to the pod, and Kalen drops the Donovan goal against Algeria as his favorite moment. Colt says it's been his favorite moment too, and it was the only thing running through my head when Kalen said that. All he heard was Ian Dark yelling, go, go, USA! <laughs> he says he got chills 10 years later. At that moment, Colt was in the Marines on his first deployment in the middle of the Indian Ocean on the USS Pearl Harbor. He was crammed in a tiny room with a 15-inch computer monitor as the TV, watching with 20 other guys. He says the most amazing soccer memory of his life. So uh, an awesome memory from Colt in Topeka. And we'll end here since we kind of teased it with Stephen Badisher. Doug Bradley says he uh, calling for that all-time load 11. He's from Mays, Kansas, too. So we got double Kansas <laughs> oh, in the mailbag. Hmm. Uh, and I put together sort of a... Um, We're going to have our own version of the Tiger King with Andrew Weavy here. I know. <laughs> Kansas I, know. Style. I, know some, I know some Tiger King folk from I, my, uh, my oh, days I, in I don't camp. doubt it. <laughs> Here's help me out here. Help me out here because I have sort of a, a, a eleven nailed down. I don't have a goalkeeper, so think on that right now. If you guys have any all load goalkeepers, we already talked about it. Twenty fourteen Galaxy Jaime Pineda. No, really? No, he no. wasted time like an expert. Fans no. hated I'm gonna, him. I'm gonna Doyle I'm, knows. I'm gonna disagree with that. Even though I, he is up there. He is up there. <laughs> He did it to us in the MLS Cup final. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, who would say. who would be your number one most most loathed goalkeeper then, Charlie? Oh. Who you would have liked to play with but hated yeah. playing against? Think on mm -hmm. that because I got Rafa Marquez on my back line. I definitely have Eddie Robinson on my back line. Do you I'm have still Pe you have Mike Pecky. Oh, I don't, but Mike Pecky should go in there probably. So we'll go Rafa Marquez, Eddie Robinson, and Mike Pecky on the back line. Midfield, you got to have Felipe. You got to have. Gotta ben have Ben Olsen, he's in there. Hold on. Nigel yeah. DeYoung, I think you have to have. Yeah, it was sure. too it was too short of a time in MLS, okay. though. Okay. How about Dima Komaliko? He's got to be Kyle, in there. Kyle Beckerman's got to be in there, right? Ozzy Alonso's got to shout. The midfield is packed. You can't, you can't just list six <laughs> demons. You have to pick the most loathed demon. Who is it? I think I, it's Dima. Dima wasn't a demon. Yeah, that's fair. But how, what what formation are you playing, Doyle? I don't know. I haven't thought it through enough, but you just have to, you can't. You <laughs> can't just... Felipe, Felipe is up is top two for me. Felipe and Dima Felipe can play in front of the six. Yeah. yeah, Felipe and Dima and Dima play in front of a six. It's more sort of like that old school pressing SKC team. You don't need a number ten. You're creating through all your loathsome actions on the field. And then up top, I have Zlatan, I have Linhart, and I have Sochkov. So I don't. I need one more. Def we we set the defender. 
And we got to decide the midfield. But are those you play, uh, you're are the playing Lenny players. on the wing. You're playing Lenny and Cristo <laughs> on the on the wing. No, what is this week? No, they're all just they're all just in the middle, just like banging on center backs, just making it a living hell for them. Oh. We don't have to play an actual formation. God, here. Doyle's imagination is so God. strong. <laughs> I know. He's like, what on the wing? What you I'm have to understand the structure in order to subvert <laughs> it. It's just basic. All right, 401-206-0 MLS. Hit us up with some texts as you sit around your house bored and you should be at home. We'll just reiterate that one. Um, social distance, please, everyone. Email us, extra time at MLSsoccer.com. We will do more Mount Rushmore's on Thursday and check in with you then. For now, we'll see you next time. Have a good week, everybody. 